exist here in other forms, and you can take these underlying structures, the structuralist notion, and transform them into something else. Again, it's having that understanding of what's out there and what's possible. Um, this is a picture of San Gignano. Uh, my family and I visited this a few years ago, and it, it's a wonderful example of resilience from the point of, uh, point of view of durability. And uh, I'm not advocating that we build buildings that look like this. First of all, we couldn't afford them um, because stone masonry like this is very, very expensive. Um, it also, we couldn't build them because they're not good in seismic zones. Um, but what they are a good example of is um, designing for um, the future shocks and stresses of increased um, and more energetic weather events. Um, if you look at this graph here, um, it, it's, it's a really good example of how significantly the, uh, the um, number of extreme weather events, Category 5, which is like hurricanes and cyclones of some significance, like Ike and Katrina, um, have increased in numbers from 1980 to 2008. In 1980, there were four of them in the world. In 2008, there were 40. That's a tenfold increase. That's, that's significant. And the, and the trend is, is upwards. And not only is the trend upwards in terms of the frequency, but also of the intensity. And what's going on, it's pretty simple, is if you have this sphere, the, the planet, with the atmosphere, which is air, filled with water, and you add energy to it in the form of an increased um, uh, or a hotter atmosphere, just by a little bit, but every little bit counts when you're looking at it on such a grand scale. Um, first of all, more water gets sucked up into the atmosphere. The atmosphere is warmer, so it can hold more water. And all of that water vapor in the atmosphere is more energized by the energy. So all of a sudden, all of the reactions occurring have more energy in them. So everything happening, all the hurricanes and cyclones, etc., they all have more energy, more energy, higher winds, um, more water in them, and can do more damage. So whereas you were planning for 100-year storms before, a lot of people are now saying, no, 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 that's the 10-year storm you're planning for. 1,000-year storms are 100-year storms. So the new normal that you have to look at is a much more vigorous, energetic, and destructive um, weather system, set of weather systems, potentially. So have a look at this now and compare it to San Giuliano. Well, these are taller towers, um, but imagine a, a Category 5 hurricane, like Hurricane Hazel, ripping through the downtown of Toronto, with, or Vancouver for that matter, with all this, these lovely glass condos. They're great for view. They really suck when it comes to energy because they're basically just glass. They bleed energy as badly as the a, as a buildings made of brick in the, in the 60s. Um, but unlike a building that is, is it is built like the ones you saw in New York City um, with a uh, solid masonry where the windows are going to be blown out by a hurricane um, or some sort of significant wind system coming through. This will rip, a, a good hurricane coming through these kind of buildings will tear everything out of the buildings because all these buildings are, are slabs of concrete with elevator cores running up the middle and some structural um, uh, members every so often on the outside, and other than that, they're just see-through inside. So you get a you get a good wind blowing, and it would just rip through all of this stuff. So very very undurable systems, and um, as a result, something that as you plan into the future, planners don't have a lot of control over how buildings are designed. That comes with the building code, which is a provincial jurisdiction. But just be cognizant, if you're called in or you're part of stakeholder groups, that this is not good stuff in the future. Um, New York City, more contemporary durability. This was built at the turn of the century. These are masonry built buildings. They range from anywhere from five to uh, 20 stories. And they're extremely durable buildings. Um, when something rips through 
in terms of storm uh, a city like this, basically what you'll see is windows being blown out, and that's about it. Very, very durable, and as a result, very resilient. Um, local energy. Uh, everyone, I think, thinks in, in uh, Canada, at least, of local energy being this, these wind turbines. And they're actually quite productive, but they have really big problems in that they only turn when the wind's blowing, and you can't determine when that's going to be, so there's an energy storage problem. And I won't go into the big, uh, uh, big spiel about uh, um, the problems with these things, but it's, it's one source of energy. Other source of energy, as, as Homer Dixon pointed out, are geothermal. It's, it's a, an expensive technology right now because of the drilling required to get into the levels of the crust where it's hot enough to turn water into steam and drive turbines. Because basically what they do is they drill, see those, those green pipes over there in the, in the bottom lower um, right corner? Um, those are just pipes that go deep into the ground where they have drilled and, and fractured the, the Earth's crust and they pump water down, and it, when it gets down in the fracture, it heats up, it turns into steam, and then they have a hole right beside it, and then they, uh, or a little ways away, and the water comes up as steam, and it's as, uh, uh, conducted into these turbines over here, and turns electrical generators. Very, very um, effective way of generating electricity, zero carbon, um, right now, not cost effective in lots of parts of the world. You have to drill way too far down to get the, 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 that heat. But as time passes and energy scarcity starts to work its magic, then this you'll probably see as a potential future um, uh, generator of electricity. Um, at uh, the website that, that I moderate, resiliencecity.org, um, we ran a competition this past year and we haven't uh, announced the winner yet, um, but this was one of the finalists for um, an idea about producing uh, carbon neutral biofuel. Biofuel, as you probably know now, is a dirty word, because if you're making biofuel ethanol, for example, from corn, it takes almost more energy to make the ethanol than, it, than you get out of the ethanol itself. But what this individual was proposing in Singapore was that they create a system of nodes that cover the big uh, uh, PIE uh, expressway that runs across Singapore. And that, those nodes um, suck the CO2 and CO off the highways and, and bring it into algal farms. And the algal farms would then use the CO2 coming from the cars and produce, they, they would be al algae that produced diesel and oil of sorts that could be then used to um, produce fuel for the car. So you've got a carbon neutral system there. And this is their idea for some of the farms that, that would be over top of the highways. And these things have huge um, uh, planes on them that are covered with different sorts of algae that grow on the sides and this would be harvested. So something off in the future, but, a, but and, and very intriguing in the way they have formed the actual structures. But uh, certainly an idea that is something that whose time hasn't come yet because of the cost versus the, the, the cost of energy right now, but down the road we'll start to see these inversions happening where, where things that weren't cost effective before all of a sudden flip at a certain value somewhere around $150 to $200 and become feasible. So when someone comes to you as a planner wanting to build over top of the 401 algal plants, don't write it off, it's completely cuckoo. Um, and this is uh, an example of local food. The uh, reality is in Canada, we do not um, have the ability to grow the food that we consume, um, even if we did have the existing, uh, the formerly existing farmlands before suburbia um, grew over top of it. Um, most of all of our food comes um, from Mexico and California by truck uh, to the food terminals and is distributed and there's a constant stream of these trucks on the highway all the time bringing food up. And then there's other specialty food, as you know, there's oranges from Israel and peppers from Holland and so forth, tulips from Holland. And so you've got a, a possibility in the future where transportation, that's all assuming that transportation is dirt cheap and really is not, nothing more than a marginal cost. In the future when transportation costs um, increase because of energy scarcity, then you'll start